Yes, you can hardly do a project in almost any jurisdiction in the U.S., certainly, and becoming true in most of the world without looking at environmental impacts of proposed projects or modifications of projects uh, and looking at assessments of those environmental impacts. Uh, so, it, and, and risk assessment is a very common way to look at and satisfy whether projects should be green-lighted, whether they should be modified before being green-lighted. Uh, so those are inherent to almost, uh, almost any project that I do. Yes. Dr. Saab, um, were you asked by Protect PT to evaluate the environmental impacts analysis associated with those application materials? Yes, uh, through Council, obviously, I looked at uh, all of the record uh, that was available to, to me uh, to form an idea about the project, about what is planned, uh, and what sort of environmental analysis has been done. Uh, and uh, so I looked at as much information as was available uh, to, to help me. I want to uh, direct your attention to the PP PPC plan that was submitted as part of the uh, application materials. Um, did you review that plan in detail? And how, how does a plan like this relate to an evaluation of environmental impacts and uh, air quality risk analysis? Well, I reviewed that plan uh, because uh, typically a plan like that would contain a fair amount of site-specific information. Uh, about the project, about what is planned at the Poseidon well site. Uh, and I reviewed that, uh, not so much that it would give me environmental analysis, but it would give me project background, so that I can use that in the environmental analysis or review the environmental analysis with that knowledge. Uh, unfortunately, when I looked at the plan, it was uh, written very generically. It was written, and, and you can look for yourselves, uh, it, it makes passing reference to Poseidon. There's a, there's a figure and you know, maybe a few mentions of Poseidon in the body of the plan, but it was written very generically. Uh, and in fact, maybe its purpose was to apply to multiple other sites besides Poseidon. So it did not really help me get much information about the project per se. I'll give a specific example. I mean, and it's come up before, it's an important one, about the whole issue of the firing range and lead emissions. That's the kind of stuff that might have been discussed there because it's unique to the Poseidon site, perhaps, and not generic, uh, but there's no mention of that. So, I, I, as I say, uh, uh, I didn't find it very useful. And in your review of the materials, um, did, did you find any uh, estimates for the emissions associated with normal storage as, as proposed? No, that is precisely what I was looking for. And, uh, and that's one of the striking things about this assessment and how it has come to this stage without any quantification of air emissions from any routine operations that will be inherently part of the well pad uh, installation and uh, all the stages including, uh, including production, which, uh, which I might note is, is, is slated to go on for 30 to 100 years according to the applicant. Uh, so you have a fairly ambitious uh, time period in front of you uh, that uh, you're going to approve. Uh, and yet we know nothing about the mass of air contaminants, any air contaminant. Uh, somebody mentioned lead, people had seen that as an issue, and I'll hopefully speak about that more. But uh, none of them. The only quantification I've seen is in this uh, air modeling study, which, however, only deals with spills. And is, is it correct that one, one conclusion you draw is that this uh, air and hydro report under predicts impacts because it does not evaluate routine operations, is that correct? Yes, uh, the way these analyses are done, if, you, if your scope is limited, then it will obviously under, underestimate the impact. If your scope is uh, constrained, then you will not be able to recapture that constrained scope in some other fashion. You will have to uh, obviously then under predict, because you're starting out with a much smaller scope. There's a fairly well-established way how you do these air assessments. You quantify the emissions uh, using some models. And this is a different kind of modeling than what was brought up before. It's not dispersion modeling as opposed to monitoring. These are emission models. And then you use dispersion models to look at their impacts. Now the air monitoring and hydro report uh, doesn't use any EPA models. It uses some equations from what is called the Turner Handbook from the early 
70s, uh, but the, 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 the field has progressed considerably before. Uh, it, it's almost like I would stand here and pull out my slide rule and <laughs> start to do computations. Uh, it would surprise you guys, uh, or, or all of you folks, if I did that. It was so it, it was jarring in just the technique that had been used uh, to try and do evil. Uh, th th Dr. Long had testified to the ubiquity of air emissions and also the common risks um, that, that we encounter every day. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit uh, about your opinion on, on the ubiquity of air emissions and how that relates to uh, a well pad site such as the one proposed here? Yes, I, I actually heard the testimony and I was very surprised, uh, somewhat, somewhat shocked actually. Because in risk assessments, uh, we look at the incremental risk due to a project, and we make very, and that's the practice, and it's been true in this country for 30 years, and I'm sure Dr. Long would agree with me, that you take great pains to distinguish between what are called voluntary risks and involuntary risks. There is a difference between facing risk and taking risk. A lot of us take risks in our day-to-day -day life. But we do that because we expect a return, the reward, something. I get in a car, I take a risk, but it gets me someplace faster. Uh, I eat a hamburger, which might have uh, BHS and the charred stuff. But, you know, I, I make my own judgments that I don't like the taste and I'm going to it. But that is different from facing involuntary risk. Risk that is impacting me, for which I get no benefit. And we draw that distinction very significantly because one has a risk-benefit attached to it, the other has only risk with no benefit attached to it. And you cannot go mingle the two. And so idea of, well, people have the same pollutants in their house, people are eating this stuff, people are doing this, is irrelevant. Because what people do in their house and whether they decide to pose the risks, they have made judgments as to what benefits they might accrue from them. We don't know that. But in our project assessments, we do risk assessments of the incremental risk that this project will impact others. And that's the distinction. So I, when he went into the ubiquity of stuff, uh, I think that was lost. Uh, and frankly, I think almost lost over. And that's an important distinction to keep in mind. Dr. Sagu, uh, I think in, in your report, uh, you had mentioned <coughs> concerns with lead emissions, and, and there was some discussion of that in the testimony tonight. Um, can, can you clarify any of that for us? Uh, I had raised that as a point because I saw the firing range referenced. At that point, I didn't have much detail uh, uh, other than the fact that there was a firing range in that area, and I know from many studies I've done on firing ranges that quite naturally there are obviously spent casings, and there's lead, there's lead fumes that deposit there, and so you have lead contamination. Perhaps that recognizing that they have tried to stay away from substantially all of the firing range area. But what I heard today made me even more concerned. If you are going to have an infiltration basin on portion of that, unless you can tell me that all the lead that is there is insoluble lead, then you have leaching of lead to groundwater. That's what an infiltration basin is. You put water so it infiltrates back to the ground. If there is lead all over the place, and there are many, many lead compounds that are soluble lead compounds. What do you think is going to happen with them? They're going to infiltrate. So it went from being a concern to a fairly significant concern once I heard today's testimony. And secondly, uh, it, uh, on, on, on a related note, even if you cordon off areas, unless you have a good plan to avoid it completely, and I can't see how, you're going to have track out emissions. <laughs> There's going to be vehicle traffic that's going to go all over the place, and it's going to bring in stuff, and it's going to spread it around. So yes, the concern about the firing range, its footprint, its lack of characterization of the footprint, and you heard testimony that no samples were actually collected and analyzed for lead, the unknown data gap there as to what is actually there, and frankly, the admission that you're going to put an infiltration basin and in the process leach lead into groundwater, that doesn't provide more comfort, it actually reduces the comfort. No, other than the idea that these type of assessments have been done many times. We're not doing something here, or proposing something here to be done uh, that plows new ground, so to speak. Uh, uh, looking at emissions, looking at their emission rates, running models to look at their impacts, doing a risk assessment, uh, comparing the risk assessment to the 
What kinds of numbers Dr. Long proposed to one in a million risk or so on? Uh, those things are done all the time. And so I, I thought that this is actually premature. If there's an environmental analysis required for whatever reason in your ordinance, and I'm not questioning your ordinance, I'm not interpreting it for you, I'm just going by the face of what is written in plain English, which is it has certain environmental assessment requirements that go with it. If that is the case, and you don't know much about the site, you haven't done the emission calculations, you haven't run the dispersion models or any models to look at the impacts on routine operations. And it's concerning because, you know, this state, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. the PADP gets reports of actual air emissions from many, many well sites. There are databases. And you see well sites reporting 50 tons, 60 tons, 100 tons, 80 tons of VOC emissions from operating well sites all the time. So you, these are not de minimis just because intuitively they have to be de minimis. You can do that analysis. And until that analysis is done, you folks have a tough job to try and interpret and fill in those gaps is the way I see it. I mean, and you could fill it. You could fill it very easily uh, by doing that analysis. Thank you, Dr. Sadia. That's uh, all the questions I have for you right now.